Green Day being my favorite band makes it so much harder to rank their albums, so I hope you can empathize with the struggle at least a little bit. Just know that I didn't come to these decisions lightly. Hey neighbor, welcome back to Ranked, the place where I take a band's entire discography and put them in order from worst to best, along with giving each record a letter grade on the tier list. Green Day is my favorite band, so naturally they were the first ones I covered back in 2017 when I started this show. And now that the Bay Area punk trio has dropped a few more records, I wanted to reevaluate every album, including Shenanigans, even though it's definitely not a studio album and won't appear in the overall ranking. You know the drill. Annihilate the like button like you've only got one fucking minute left and let's get to ranking unicorns pop rocks and commercial jingles the album the experience the nightmare killed off early by a global pandemic father of all motherfuckers isn't the worst album of all time nor was it close to being the worst of 2020 but god is it more uneven than a whale and taylor swift on a seesaw As a staunch defender of Dose and a fan of Green Day's offshoot band Foxboro Hot Tubs, you'd think I'd be all over this, like an alley rat to cheese, but therein lies the problem, the unbearable amounts of cheese. I made an entire episode of I Got It Wrong, going over my initial review of the album, some of the denial we were all going through as fans, telling ourselves that it was just a joke album to finish out their contract, but we all know how that went. It's hard to deny most of Green Day's worst songs have a home on this island of misfit noise. Oh yeah, sucks baboon butts. I Was a Teenage Teenager is probably the dumbest song they've done, and Fire Ready Aim is ready-made for sports highlight reels in nothing else. It's all so commercial and boring. I will say, the title track is a massive banger, although it took some getting used to the falsetto vocals. And Graffiti a Slaps, what a great closer that balances power pop with garage rock and I really hope that they do more songs in that vein in the future. Knowing how much Billy Joe Armstrong still loves Father of All is kind of precious, because to many of us, it's a hot mess on stilts. But to the artist that made it, if you find joy in it, then cool by me. I'm gonna put it all the way down in the D tier, just to show separation between this and the rest of the discography. Then I 2012 was somehow the most exciting but worst year ever for Green Day fans. I did a video a while back rolling the best songs from the trilogy into one great album, so check that out if you're curious, but that's not the real thing, so explore the entire trilogy we shall. We got three new albums within three months of each other, music videos, content galore, only OGs remember the guys' original Instagram handles from this era, but we also got Billy in the unrelenting grip of alcoholism in the infamous iHeartRadio meltdown. Give me a fucking break, one minute left. Uno initially hooked me with its barrage of no-frills rock and roll shot straight from the hip, but the bullets don't seem to rip through me the same way now. Either that, or I've been wearing a built-in bulletproof backpack. Everything musically is incredibly predictable. The song structures are basically just copy-paste, where you can guess exactly when the guitar solo will start. Some songs and solos are great. The album can be a lot of fun. I dig Rusty James, Let Yourself Go, That's a Timeless Ripper, and Nuclear Family stands in a league of its own. What works really works, what doesn't quickly loses its appeal. I'm gonna put Uno a level up at the C tier, C for copy-paste. Some little boy named Train, as we can, I'll tell you the same. Trey leads revolution number 12, and it goes about as well as any other revolution that happened with zero preparation went. Oh! The final installment in the trilogy has some really, really cool songs that don't sound like anything else the band had ever tried before. It feels like they took a detour into a cornfield, but just kept on plowing ahead like they hadn't even left the highway. Which is dope. I actually like a good chunk of Trey. But the track listing feels kind of poorly arranged and haphazard since some songs fit, 
others stick out like a sore thumb. Meat and Potatoes Rock might still dominate overall, but props to tracks like Brutal Love, Amanda, and Dirty Rotten Bastards for being so damn good. Brutal Love in particular is brilliant vocally. The atmosphere on both that, the album opener, and the closing track, The Forgotten, yes, I know it's from the Twilight series, doesn't matter. They deviate from the formula and crush it because of that. Trey is a solid experience, just one that I don't come back to very often. I'm gonna be generous and put it right there on the tier list ranking. Green Day's first album released all the way back in 1990. What a time to not be alive. Not yet. Rough around the edges punk rock with a sense of desperate yearning to be loved, understood, and intentionally misunderstood or excluded? The musicianship is pristine as hell, considering it was recorded in just 22 hours at the end of the 1980s to usher in a new decade. Oh, Oh no, I said Usher. Yeah, I'll bring your fucking Usher back up here, goddammit. The sheer will of the band, with John Kiffmeyer still on drums, to make something that would outlive the punk scene and blossom into a bigger version of itself? Kudos for having the third eye to make that happen at such a young age. Punk purists call it one of, if not their best album, but it's far from that, even though it's still really great. It says a lot about the band, that we're at number 11 of 14 in the ranking, and I'm already having trouble coming up with complaints. At the library, I Was There, Rest, and The Judge's Daughter are my top four songs from 39 Smooth, and I'm gonna put it up there in the B tier. Dose is overflowing with energy like an excited puppy. Not always the right energy for the situation, but damn if it's not infectious. Many consider Dose to be the sophomore album of garage rock offshoot Foxboro Hot Tubs, and I guess that makes sense. It does sound like they're chasing down that sound with a few very weird caveats that I actually like. And she resides in my mind. It's the unpredictability with side helpings of raunchy drum grooves, rocketeering riffs, and manic vocals that make this the best album in Green Day's trilogy. That's already a hot take, but it gets even hotter because I'm once again asking you to acknowledge Nightlife as a misunderstood gem that perfectly complements Lady Cobra, the song directly before it that's ultimately way better, but together they work in tandem. Sprinkling in more of that garage magic makes Dose feel raw and out of control, and I brought song receipts to prove it. Makeout party, while that's loud, stop when the red lights flash. Some of these songs kind of suck almost intentionally. Like, fuck time, you can't tell me that they didn't have the intention of making this hilariously dumb. And Ashley is a track that's dime a dozen filler, but those to me are outliers in an album full of diamonds that includes the strutting stunner Stray Heart and the searing burn Lazy Bones. Come on, Dose, you're drunk. Let's let's get you home. You you said you were in apartment B, right? You live there? B it is. Oh, you can stop holding your breath. Revolution Radio has fallen a bit in the ranking, but that doesn't mean that I don't still love most of this album. Green Day swung for the fences again with their 12th studio record. And while they didn't hit it out of the ballpark, it's a solid run-scoring double off the wall, or in non-baseball terms, they unleash the bangers, but run into a few issues along the way. Elephant in the Room is the production. I've really felt the weight of the problem the longer I've sat with the album, and given that they produced it themselves, just imagine how much better Rev Rad would have sounded with Rob Cavallo. Not that it sounds bad, it just 
it's kind of mangled in the mix with some songs and instruments elevated way too high or low. It's great that they didn't fall into the trap of trying to write another rock opera after the trilogy kind of backfired on their sanity at least. The lyrics definitely feel heated with political undertones, but it doesn't exclusively play to one narrative lyrically or musically. Thick bass lines rollick, while Billy stops to smell the flowers, guitar in hand, defined even further by the tracks Somewhere Now, Outlaws, and Forever Now, which are among the best Rev Rat has to offer. <laughs> Bang Bang instantly clicked as a Green Day classic, Bouncing Off the Wall gets its dumb sleaze on in the best way, and while I am stopping myself short from talking about every single song, just don't sleep on the title track or troubled times either, okay? Okay, to the B tier you go, Revolution Radio. This doesn't feel right. I've had a roller coaster affair with 21st Century. It was the first one I was there for on release day, and I played it non-stop too much to the point where I can still taste the summer of 09. <laughs> Green Day's second concept album went even larger on the bombast, echoing legends such as The Who while evolving into a uniquely textured hour-plus-long experiment. Feisty guitars lead the charge, but it's the backing vocals, steadfast drumming, and tactful takedown lyrics acting as the Trojan horse meant to conquer your subconscious while you rock out. You don't have to care about the overarching concept to care about these songs, but it definitely helps getting to know the album protagonists, Christian and Gloria. The political landscape of the late 2000s was at a crossroads, and this record very much reflects that fallout, for better or worse. Immaculate pacing makes the 18-song tracklist zoom by just like that. Albums over an hour really need to justify that runtime, and they make it count, stuffing classics all over this thing. Well, Before the Lobotomy, Murder City, Viva La Gloria, American Eulogy, Restless Heart Syndrome? Uh, hello, operator. I'm drowning in bangers over here. Send in the Peacemaker. While I'm at it with the horrible puns, let me just say that this horseshoe is a hand grenade. So stay golden, pony boys. Take a seat with the A-listers. Turning blue while praying to the music gods for a Green Day renaissance felt like my only option in the awkward time gap between albums 13 and 14. Plays it across, Johnny Goodrell scores! Don't worry, I'm still breathing, mostly because Saviors is a total banger. Billy Joe, Mike Durnt, and Trey Cool are also ridiculously skilled. We already knew that, but listening to Saviors... You hear nothing but seasoned veterans that haven't settled, they're instead still hungry to find new ways to unleash their individual talents. Don't call it a comeback, call it finding the path again after that unexpected off-roading excursion, probably into a cornfield. I was sober, now I'm drunk again. How exactly were we supposed to not be foaming at the mouth for the album after hearing the singles? The American Dream is Killing Me knocked the lights out. Look Ma No Brains cranked the time machine back to the 90s punk, and Dilemma ripped the drop D chords to become their best song since American Idiot. The deep cuts range from vivacious political tent poles like Coma City, to dad rock cowbell bangers, beautiful odes to life and family, and anti-anthemic punk rock heavy hitters like 1981. <laughs> Saviors kicks ass, takes names, and makes its way into the top half of my Green Day ranking not by chance, by fate, because every member played their ass off, aided even further by the killer production crew. Check out my full review of the album if you want to see me go even deeper into the individual songs, and I'm placing Saviors up there in the A tier. Sharing a birthday with an album, not just the month and day, but the same year, entering the world in the same breath? 
pretty fucking cool and rare if you ask me. So uh, I'm legally obligated to let you once again know that I was born on the same day as Green Day's Kerplunk. I swear to God, if you guys bully me about my fun fact, life is hard enough. Let me have this one, okay? It's either that or I'm gonna start rambling about the time I met American Idol's Clay Aiken while on a school field trip in 2003. And trust me, you do not want 2003 John from ARTV. We don't know him. Kerplunk is rich with vocal harmonies, persistent DIY production, and no-holds-barred punk spirit that's impossible to contain or not enjoy. Lovably unpolished and unapologetically open, this sophomore album took the strong foundation of 39 Smooth and took it to the next level by incorporating everything they'd learned from sharpening up their live shows and cutting their debut. The original version of Welcome to Paradise is on it, so that's cool. It's a great song no matter which version you prefer, but since you haven't seen Dookie on the list yet, I I'm just gonna let you take a guess about my preference. Trey Cool joined as the band's new drummer during this era as John Kiffmeyer transitioned out of Green Day, giving us plenty of personality behind the kit, and of course, his iconic contribution, the country tune dominated Love Slave. I really do love this album to death. It's bursting with unforgettable tenacity. You hear in the veins of this record exactly why they exploded, and it's nice that Billy Joe himself thinks of it so fondly decades later. Kerplunk, I just dropped you in the A tier, and if I had to pick a top four for this record, I'll go Christy Road, One of My Lies, One for the Razorbacks, and 80. The year 2000. The band? Take a guess. The outcome? A divided fan base, dwindling sales, and a punk band completely out of their element for an album unlike anything else in their sizable discography. A growing sense of maturity permeates this 12 song track list, as you'll see tiny little steps towards American Idiot at the hands of the politically charged singles Minority and Warning. They're able to blend a more refined palette into their brand of pop punk, seasoning the edges with folk punk and power pop for a fascinating album that's a blast to listen to. One minute they're serving up Halloween party favors on Misery, the next they're all upbeat chanting about deadbeat holidays. That's how it needed to be for an album like this. It's not necessarily reinventing the wheel, more so the band itself. No particular order in my top four from Warning, I'll go with Blood, Sex, and Booze, Waiting, which I'm so glad I got to see live, Jackass, and Castaway. Warning is borderline S tier, but just for clarity and separation's sake, Warning is going to the front of the line for the A's, which I'm sure Billy Joe Armstrong wouldn't mind. Let's give Insomniac its flowers. Not because it's some hidden masterpiece no one knows, but come on. You know getting sandwiched in between a Dookie and a Nimrod makes Insomniac a short king. Clocking at just 33 minutes, the band's second major label leaned away from pop, which is not what most fans and critics at the time expected. Actually, they tapped more into their punk roots than ever before, becoming Green Day's punkiest album other than the early work, of course, the one where they perfected a truly iconic sound and tone. Billy chose the perfect title for what he was battling at the time. Not just insomnia, but meth addiction, nightly ragers, and trying to balance his personal life and his new child, his marriage, with this sudden massive fame that had just landed in his lap the year before. Geek Stink Breath is a go-to for this because of the direct reference to pulling scabs off my face, but it's less clear what's sinking his boat on the likes of Brat, or the always choice cut Babs Uvilla Who. Mike's bass sizzles and pops like bacon, Trey smacks the shit out of the drums, making this one of their heaviest sounding records, with Billy Joe commanding the chaos in pissed off form, with most of that anger pointed back at himself. Top four, I'm going Babs Uvilla Who, Stewart in the Avenue, Geek Stink Breath, and I know it's cheating, but Brains Through Jaded, and for the tier list map, obviously we're going all the way up. Oh, 
Nimro, Raggy. Nimrod dropped down to number three. What, do I have to have some sort of personal falling out with an album to justify it being lower in a ranking than it was seven years ago? Oh, I do? Oh, okay. God, what can we say about Nimrod, huh? It flat out rules, there's that, but I'm trying to think of how to convey why it hits so hard. Think of Nimrod like a five course meal. Only the meal orders are randomized, so you might get some dessert back to back with an appetizer. Somehow it all goes off without a hitch, and thanks to Lead Chef Prosthetic Head, we're able to close up shop with a sense of pride. I hope I didn't make that sound like Hell's Kitchen. It's more like Cutthroat Kitchen with all three bandmates winning the grand prize together. The album came out in 1997 and proved popular among their fans and mainstream audiences alike. The guys tightened the screws all around, playing hard and fast on the walloping cuts Platypus, I Hate You, and The Grouch, breaking out the mellow grooves on Uptight and Last Ride In, then cementing their place in alternative rock history with Nice Guys Finish Last and their underrated masterpiece, Scattered. Damn, this is tough, huh? Let me think. Uh, I think S-tier all the time. Boomer moment? They don't make them like this anymore. Who'd have thunk a timeless masterpiece of teenage angst and bitter coming-of-age truth would go by the name of Dookie? It's still funny, and it proves that Green Day have never taken themselves too seriously, because they went into the studio with their first big label budget, and they had a vision, and they made that dream come true. Pure, unadulterated punk with precision, pop, and persistence. The three Ps, a pinnacle of American engineering. Dookie is stacked with hit songs that defined entire generations. What's even better is that it's not a hot fuss type of situation where the singles far outweigh the strength of the deep cuts. The deep cuts is where Dookie hits a stride, thanks to booming rippers like Burnout, FOD, and Coming Clean. The barrage of musical inertia is like a big injection of serotonin, even when the subject matter wanders off to the darker corners of the mind. Dookie is endlessly replayable 30 plus years later and deserves its reputation as one of the best albums of all time. Top four, gun to my head, the Bulling Teeth, Burnout, Sassafras Roots, Longview. You know exactly what tier this one's going to, but before I reveal my number one, please take a split second to support the channel by liking the video, subscribing, and turning on notifications so you get notified when I upload future videos like this and other ranked episodes, and check out all of my Green Day content at the playlist linked in the description down below. The album that reignited Green Day's mainstream career also changed my entire life. No hyperbole, no sarcastic joke or cutaway. I don't know who, what, or where I would be without American Idiots. So to everyone involved in its creation, thank you, thank you, a million times thank you. After the partially completed Cigarettes and Valentines album was stolen, the trio went back to the drawing board and came up with a magnum opus theatric as fuck political rock opera with relatable characters coming of age in a rapidly disintegrating society. Rock operas have a way of dominating my rotation still today, and I blame my earliest influence for that. Not that it's a problem, it's a preference. For me, it's a start-to-finish experience of locking in knowing that I'm never hitting that skip button. The Jesus of Suburbia, aka Saint Jimmy, is our protagonist, growing up disillusioned and jaded with authority. Rebuttals and revelations galore unlock over the course of an hour of non-stop missile strikes. I'm talking about tracks like Holiday, Letter Bomb, She's a Rebel. She's a re Gargantuan, arena-ready riffs pour gasoline on an introspective fire, lighting up the airwaves with relevant messaging that still rings true more than ever in our modern-day political death roll. The sheer versatility to be able to work out multiple nine-minute epics without ever wasting a second is jaw-dropping. Jesus of Suburbia and Homecoming are insane testaments to the work ethic of a punk band willing to bend the unwritten law of never straying too far from your comfort zone. American Idiot is unmistakably Green Day. Mike and Trey are playing their hard out. Billy Joe nails some of his best vocals and lyric writing ever as it helped define the band's second wind and introduced them 
to a new generation, including me, causing us to not only love the new stuff, but also the old. I don't have to look at American Idiot with rose-tinted glasses to appreciate it, because it's still just as killer, if not more so, than the day I laid ears on it in March 2005, hearing it for the first time skating with some old neighborhood friends. Holy shit, this just fell out of the CD after all these years, decades later. Get it on your flip phone, y'all. S-tier is a given for the album that expertly flexed what an ordinary group of guys from the Bay Area, California could do when they truly thought outside of the box. As promised, I'm gonna briefly talk about shenanigans. Yeah, finally. And if you wanna see a full retrospective review on this compilation album that I think justifiably is not going into the ranking proper, get this video to 3,000 likes and you've got yourself a deal. I'm an Shenanigans released in 2002 as a collection of odds and ends, B-sides, for those old enough to remember what B-sides are, this is a killer collection that I haven't respected enough. I'll say it. Shenanigans is really, really good. It's an interesting behind-the-scenes look into what didn't make some of their albums up to that moment in time. I wish DUI was on here too, since I just finally scored the vinyl after years on the hunt, but I understand why it's not. I digress. It's still chocked full of some unexpected moments. Not all songs are winners, but definitely more hits than misses, and if you really want to see it stacked into the tier list, which I know you do, I'm comfortable putting this at the B tier. Thanks for watching me rank the Green Day albums. Leave your ranking in the comments along with any thoughts you might have had on my list. 3,000 likes and I'll do a full shenanigans review. Subscribe because I've got plenty of other videos about this band floating above or around me, and I'll see you soon on ARTV.